Uh, Michael, I want to officially begin. By my clock, we're 20 seconds early, but I think we can live with that. Clock, we're 20 seconds early, but I think we can live with that. Sangha with great virtue out of compassion for the sake of this assembly and all living beings. Please turn the wonderful Dharma wheel to teach us how to leave suffering attain bliss and end birth and death and quickly realize non-birth. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhudasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto suche doye alahuri san miao san putoshi. Namo Saranto Suche Doya Alahadi Sanyao Sanputoshe. Together, Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa. By Chen Wan Jie Nan Sao Yu. O Jin Jen Wan De Shou Chi. Yen Jie Ru Lai Chen Shi Yi. 
supreme and wondrous dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in a million eons. But now we see it, hear it, and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master and Dharma friends, welcome to our Sutra Lecture. We say, Shifu Shangren, Goe Shishong, Tajia Omi Tofo. Let's see who is here. We're going to expand our window. There we go. Yes, there's hello to everyone. Um, my name is Hung Shur, and I, hi, Roberta. Buenas noches. I'm, I'm here in southeastern Queensland, where we have been living in a world of water. It has been raining torrentially for 36 hours and it just stopped. So we got sunshine outside and we're starting to see the puddles start to evaporate. And, uh, excuse me. We, uh, when it rains here, it rains a lot. And we had a, it wasn't a, a typhoon. They don't have hurricanes here, they have typhoons. It wasn't a typhoon, it was just a tropical storm. But, um, I got uh, photographs of our creek, which two days ago was dry, and then uh, suddenly it looked uh, looked like flood tide. So we're we're drying out, and everything uh, here is going to have to be mopped because uh, there's levels of water and evaporation, and the birds are drying out too. And I got some. Uh, well, maybe if we get a chance, I can show some of the. Uh, the photos of how birds dry out after a rain is <laughs> something I never thought I would be noticing, but by golly, uh, these birds um, get wet. And what do they do? They're just wet. They suffer a lot. Uh, for example, let's see here. What does it look like when a bird gets wet a after, after they're wet? They, uh, so that's not it here. Uh, show you right here. Okay, so here are some here are some very wet birds, soaking wet. This is after they have to go over every single feather, and you'll notice right up to the tip, they uh, run their feathers through their beak to increase the waterproof quality of them, and what was new to me was to learn that there are parts of their bodies that they can't reach like around their beak here are some wet wet lorikeets right you can see the water on their feathers so what do they do is they uh, clean each other off uh, and it looks just like they're kissing they're, they look like lovebirds that's why they're called lovebirds because they take turns cleaning off each other's beak area and it's the cutest thing to watch um, I unfortunately go to meeting doesn't do video very well but at least you can get a sense of it here are these lovely birds cleaning each other's beaks off and doing the, the preening that they do to get back to uh, waterproofness right and let's see if we can we can't the uh, it doesn't do movies well but one cleans the other's beak and the other and then they he takes turns and so this is this is survival strategies for beings that have lived in this area for thousands and thousands of years and uh, it's quite quite wonderful to watch how um, how the systems evolve to survive. So that's that's my news. Is it's really been wet, the water world. And this time, um, I don't think there were any fatalities. I didn't see reports of uh, what we usually hear, which is uh, foolhardy folks driving their pickup trucks through flooded roads and requiring the emergency services to come and rescue them as their cars float off downstream. That usually happens. Uh, and this time I think we made it through without people are wising up and everywhere 
on the roads, you see these big billboards that say, if it's flooded, forget it. Don't try to be heroic. Because um, the, uh, the emergency services get hundreds of calls every time there's a big storm from people who, who tried to, to brave the floodwaters in their, in their vehicles. So anyway, that's my story. Now we can invoke the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas and get our sutra lecture moving here. So I'm going to chant the name that's in the Chinese down below. The meaning is in the English. We're going to chant the Chinese syllables. So please join me if you would like to. Namo da fang guang po yen zi yen ai hui o fu sa Namo da fang guang po yen zi yen ai hui o fu sa Namo da fang guang po yen zi I am I we O Pusa Nam O Da Fang Fang Po I am Jim I am I we O Pusa Nam O Da Fang Fang Po I am Jim I am I we O Pusa, Namo Da Fang Fang Po, I am Jim, I am I Hui, O Pusa, Namo Da Fang Fang Po, I am Jim, I am I Hui, O Pusa, Today we are going to be talking about one of my favorite um, Mahayana lists uh, in all of the various practice uh, practice um, gateways. They say uh, this is. Let's see here, where are we? It's including Paramitas, definitions of the ten. Here we go. So we um, read this last time, but we're going to, we didn't finish because we, it was a big, big bite and we need to unpack it. So I'm going to start again on this section and then we'll return to where we, where we were. All right, people all together, we want to uh, recite the text. Um, let's try to do it in unison because the, the time lag uh, between Southern Hemisphere and Northern Hemisphere makes it hard to do it in, in sequence. So let's do it simultaneously. Here we go. Ready? With me together. That's the Chinese. Here's our English. We'll do the same thing, unison. Here we go. Ready? At that time, Moon of Liberation, Bodhisattva, asked Vajra Treasury, Bodhisattva, Disciple of the Buddha, is it only on the seventh ground that a Bodhisattva fulfills all the Bodhi share dharmas, or can he fulfill them on all the other grounds as well? So, to make sense of this, we have to know that what's called the Bodhisattva path is a long road. 
they measure out uh, 52 or 53 steps, depending on how, how you count it. And a cultivator, somebody who uh, wants to, um, to walk the path that a bodhisattva walks, starts out at some point and cultivates along. Um, sometimes the texts describe the progress you make as like directly vertical. Um, you go from the you know from the first ten, let's say, right up to the the, the first ten would be what are called the ten faiths, the ten stages of faith. Some people cultivate and go directly up to the uh, ten dwellings or the ten practices or the ten transferences or the ten grounds. Others uh, spend a lot of time on one and they go one, two, three, four, five, and they go step by step sequentially. So it's not fixed. Apparently, as I understand it, people can either uh, skip steps or they go step by step as they progress. Uh, maybe you knew somebody who was smart in uh, in grade school who got put ahead of grade. Do you know anybody like that? Uh, we probably know people who got held behind, you know, held back, didn't didn't get to progress. They had to repeat a grade. So apparently the Bodhisattva path is similar. You make progress vertically. Um, but there's also other ways to do it. So each, uh, now, that's the looking at it kind of abstractly. What is really going on as you, quote, make progress along the Bodhisattva path? What I understand is it's it's a course it's on the mind that it happens so sometimes people can be confused <coughs> confused about something <coughs> certainly and I can uh, think about my particular hang-ups and character flaws the name that my teacher the master Shri Ma gave me was true and real because he said I lie too much I, no story loses on the spice and the flavoring. The vinegar and the salt liberally added to the stories make it flavorfuler, make it tastier. True or not, don't ask, but it sure was interesting. Right? That's a problem if you're going to cultivate the way. Master Hua said you really need to tell the truth, be true within truth. So that's a hang up, that's an attachment for, for one sort of desire or the other produces this inability to face the truth. So um, you can get stuck in a place like that. And as I understand it, everybody has their own combination of what in Chinese are called xi qi mao bing, right? Habits and faults, things that we don't recognize. As I look at it, I think, wow, it's a good story. People will like the story and, quote, like me. You know, so that's why the, the stories get exaggerated. Well, from a cold clinical point of view, that's not the truth. You got to tell the truth if you're going to cultivate. So, as a result, in my mind, if I was putting myself in this this uh, um, hypothetical case, right, I cannot make progress on the bodhisattva path until that covering of self of desire to be liked, whatever, thins out or transforms or goes away until that darkness breaks up and the light of my nature shines. This is, you know, talking theory here. Um, I will not progress. As soon as that happens, I make progress on the Bodhisattva path. Because why? More nature has manifested is the word, has been revealed, has come to light. I'm enlightened to the degree that I let go of the darkness covering my already bright nature. Okay, that's a quick run through of the theory of how this works. So somebody who could like skip a bunch of steps on the Bodhisattva path and go from one level to higher levels without taking every step of the way would be somebody who what kind of language do we have? We had a breakthrough. Right? You know that phrase. Somebody who suddenly understood the futility of hanging on to, to greed, anger, delusion, pride, and doubt, and let them go. 
those coverings, the darkness on top, fundamentally don't exist. They're not really there originally, but we create them and hang on to them. So they're really there until we let go of them. So cultivation becomes a practice of removing those coverings. When you do that, zoom, up you go to the bodhi, to higher levels of the bodhisattva path. All right. So that's how the theory goes. Now, does it really work out that way? Um, here's our test case, our, our textbook for it, is the Abhatamsaka Sutra. And we got a question from one bodhisattva to another. Vajra Treasury, bodhisattva, is the one teaching the, the ten grounds. We're on the seventh ground. The one asking about it is named Moon of Liberation, Bodhisattva. And his question has to do with progress along the path. He says, I'm interested in these things called the 37 limbs of enlightenment, the 37 wings of awakening, the, thir the, the Bodhi shares. They have all these three names for various lists of practice. He says, where does the cultivation of that really get good? If I wanted to cultivate the Chi Puti Fanfa, the seven Bodhi shares, uh, really, really well, or the 37 limbs of enlightenment, where would I do it? Does it happen all in the seventh stage, or do you do it bit by bit all along? Please tell me. Onigai shimas. Baito, baito. Please tell me, give me, you know, I need to know, because I've I'm ready for these, this cultivation. So that's the question that sets up this whole next section of text. So think about it. Um, what he's saying is there are places along this pathway to awakening where certain practices work better than others. And if you are somebody interested in making spiritual progress along the Bodhisattva path, um, you need to know what's appropriate at each place. Example, okay, I don't know if people are swimmers, anybody's a swimmer, here, swimming? Um, I was never much of a swimmer. I, I always kind of wanted to be, but um, swimming was only something you did on vacation, and you kind of went out with your dad or your brother, and, and you didn't drown. That was kind of it, you know. If you had to get from the, the, the dock to the float out in the lake, you... Uh, Tried your, you, you floundered and kicked and splashed and made it and gasped and swallowed water. And it wasn't, you know, I didn't drown, but I was never zai in the water. I was never at ease in the water. Um, and here would be my buddies who were perfecting their uh, butterfly stroke. You know, not only did they have the Australian crawl down, did they have, could they, they could dog paddle, they could float. They could do the Australian crawl, they could do the breaststroke, they could do the backstroke, and then some of them, if you got really good, butterfly, right? You had to be strong because the butterfly relies on big latissimus muscles and triceps, and, and you, uh, you propel yourself through the water on arm strength. And wow, that was not in my dreams. Could I do that? So for me, if somebody had taught me how to do a really good crawl, that's just the standard, you know, swimming where you breathe and stroke and breathe. If I had learned that, I would have been really happy. That was appropriate for where I was. If somebody came to me and said, let me point out how to do the, the butterfly, I would have said, sorry, you know, not yet. I'm not there. I'm a brick in the water. <laughs> if I don't drown, I'm doing good. So, okay, the Bodhisattva path is the same. Some practices are appropriate at certain times. Okay, so that's the question. He says, tell me, is it on the seventh ground that you uh, perfect, you make perfect all the Bodhi shared dharmas, or can you do that anywhere along the way, anywhere along the path? Are you able to really cultivate those to perfection? He said. And last week we had a big discussion of this verb fulfill, right? Can you make them perfect? Can you do it right? That's what he's asking. Okay. So, what's the answer? Here we go. Here we are. 
，让第七地最为殊胜。何以故？此地七地，功用恒满，得入智慧自在恒故。So Vajra Treasury answers. He says, disciple of the Buddha. A bodhisattva can fulfill the bodhisattva dharmas on all the rest of the ten grounds, but the seventh ground is the best place for doing it. Why? Because on the seventh ground, practices involving the application of effort is refined. Because I said, "Oop, that should be R." Typo. Practices involving the application of effort are refined to perfection. And one masters the effortless practices of wisdom, self-mastery. That's a mouthful. Okay, he says you can do it other places, but there's one place which is really special, and that's the seventh ground. So, let's、um, check out that text. Practice that effort. E F F O T is refined to perfection, and one masters the F E F F. Okay, these are the key words here. Let's make that bigger. What's he saying? He's saying too big. The application of practices involving the application of effort are refined to perfection. Okay, that's one kind, and one masters the effortless practices of wisdom, self mastery. Okay, notice I translated "are refined," which is the idea is not done yet, still doing it, still working. He says. The seventh ground is the best place to do this. Why? Because when you get to the seventh ground, there's something different going on. What is that thing? And this is why I'm putting this down so we can look at it. He says, "Gong Yong Hang." That and Zhi Hui Zi Zai Hang. All right. What's that? Take a look. Says there we go. Do, do, do. Yes, a little bigger, please. Thank you. Gong Yong Hang. Take a look. This is interesting. Gong. Gong. Gong, yong, hang. What's this? On the seventh ground, you do this better than anywhere else. What is this? This is a so gong, yong, hang.、Uh, I should say first. I need to preface this by saying I don't know from personal experience because I'm not at the seventh ground. But I'll give you a fair textbook answer. This is practices that require the mind to move,、uh, like meditation. Okay, when you're meditating, gong yong hang. It literally means gong is like gong fu work use practices, practices that require the use of work. If you're meditating,、uh, you have to, you know, okay, good, it's quiet. I'm not talking. I'm not checking my email. I'm not reading. I'm not talking on the phone. I'm not doing anything except wait, Guang, watching. I'm watching my mind. Using maybe I'm investigating the Huato, the meditation topic. Maybe I'm reciting a mantra. I'm doing my practice, and it's work. You're moving into the practice. If you're reciting the Buddha's name, Namo Amitabha, Namo Amitabha, Namo Amitabha, Namo Amitabha Buddha, Namo Amitabha Buddha, Namo Amitabha Buddha, you're moving your mouth, you're moving, making sound, you, you know. This is Gong Yong Hang. These are all practices that 
require specific actions in body, mouth, and mind, right? You think, yeah, well, what else is there besides that? Why, why are you pointing that out? That seems so obvious, right? Well, at the seventh ground, we meet another kind of function. And that is cultivation that goes to automatic pilot. That's why I say it's not my state, right? So I can just give you an idea of what I understand it is. There is a level of practice that you could say it's almost like it's pre-coded in. What are some of the words we use? Hardwired? It's already on the hard drive of the mind. And all we have to do is invoke it, boot it up, and the program functions perfectly without any hand on the wheel. It's kind of like a self-driving car. Google is trying to put out a self-driving car. and Who else? Who are some other competing companies? That, cars that can, you know, find their way where they're going safely and arrive and not break the law, not break down. And Self-driving cars. Nobody needs to sit behind the wheel and steer and hit the pedals. So there are practices in the mind that are the same. Isn't that interesting? And you could say, isn't that scary? Um, now, what could we relate to that? Well, has anybody ever recited the Buddha's name in your dreams? Nobody wants to raise their hand because that's embarrassing. Have you, anybody, ever recited the Buddha's name in your dreams? Like, you recite to the point where, okay, Michael? Did the Buddha ever recite your name in a dream? I, gee, I, that's interesting. So, um, I, I've never had it um, recited. I never recited it myself, but I've had like other people recite in my dreams. So, it was actually, <laughs> um, if, if, if I want to get specific, it was actually Dharma Master Hung Lai, and he was just reciting for me or something. It was, it was reciting for you? Yeah. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Wow. Does, did he know about it? Did you ever tell him about it? No, I never actually told him about it. But um, it's probably a good idea. Not that you might get, you might be surprised by the answer yeah. you get. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to go hanging out in your dreams. I got my own dreams to dream. No, he, Hung Lai might give you a really good answer. You know, he might say, "Oh yeah, what night was that? Yeah, I remember that." You know. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Yeah. He was, okay. Uh, beating, he was beating on the, um, I don't know what you call it, but and then he was reciting at the same time, so it was pretty cool. The wooden fish. The wooden fish, yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool, okay. Anybody else? Anybody got stories of, okay, let's that's, see, that's, yeah, Connie's hands up over there. Hi. Um, I wasn't the one who recited in my dreams, but uh, Stacy told me that she recited, she um, had a couple of dreams where she recited the Shrangama Mantra. That was pretty cool. I just in her dreams? No kidding. Wow, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, okay, here we go. Anyone wants to say something? Um, I once woke up and I was reciting uh, Amitabha, so I must be... <laughs> Reciting. That's why when I woke up, it was so automatic that I was How about that? continuing reciting. Continuing, yeah. Okay, there we go. So look, gee whiz, there are three people, all of whom have had some connection, either directly or indirectly, with with this practice. Um, did I? So um, I have something much more modest to report, which is. I often have trouble reciting the Buddha's name when I'm wide awake. <laughs> I don't even, not even uh, dreaming, you know. It's like if I'm, I can be reciting along and I've got my, got my beads out and I'm, you know, Namo Amitabha or Namo Guanyin Pusa, Namo Dizamon Pusa, mantras. And something comes up and my thoughts go, choo! Away they go and the, the recitation is gone. You know, and then I, oh yeah, I should be ah oh, namo amitabha now. So mindfulness is hard. One channel, 
like the Buddha recitation channel, Namo Omitofu. That's hard when you're awake. It's hard when you're asleep. In fact, it's, you know, it's, it's uncommon to be able to sustain, continue the recitation of your sleep. Did I, you all know that story about Shurfu, right? This is a story that bears repeating. So it was actually um, 1980. It was the winter Chan session at, no, no, 1979, City of 10,000 Buddhas. Uh, Three Steps, One Bow had just completed. We were doing a Chan session in 1980, I guess. And Ajahn Sumedho showed up at that time. It was the first time I ever met Ajahn Sumedho. He showed up during the winter Chan. The winter Chan was held in what is now the small dining room. That used to be called the Medicine Buddha Hall, right where the boys and girls school eats. That was our Chan Hall, Medicine Master Hall during the winter. There weren't other buildings built. The four, five contemplations dining hall didn't exist at that point. And so remember, uh, it was about, this is a week, uh, was it 10 days or one week of Chan? We usually did just one, not three back then for the winter. And so uh, we were like halfway through the Chan. Everybody was like, you know, it was mid-afternoon. We'd eaten lunch, eaten a little bit too much. And, you know, it was like food coma. And our spirits were kind of low and the energy was low. And I remember Shurfu came in and he, I, I won't say he slammed the door open, but he made a loud entrance. Boom. And... It was, he was walking. He didn't sit in a Dharma seat. He's walking. And, of course, everybody's like, mm, sit up straight. Here's Sherful. Here's the teacher. And then you're nodding or, or, or like that. And so Sherful says, mm, you all are so wet behind the ears. He said, you are just such puny, med sad excuse for meditators. He said, you can't keep your huato going even for five minutes. He said, you know what I'm like? You know what it's like inside my brain? He, said, he didn't say brain. My, inside my mind, he said, I recite the Buddha's name all the time. I'm never not reciting the Buddha's name. And I never lose track. I know how many. It's not random like you guys. <laughs> So we're going, mm, boy, I didn't know that. Shurfu recites the Buddhist name all the time. And then Shurfu said, you know what else? He said, I am always reciting mantras all the time. I'm never not reciting a mantra. And it's not like you guys. I always know where I am. I never lose track and I know how many. It's not casual. It's not random. <laughs> So we're going, wait a minute, Sheriff, well, you just said, you know, hmm. So it's like, yeah? And then Sheriff said, you know what else? He said, not like you guys. I am always reciting sutras. I'm never not reciting a sutra. And I always know where I am. I never lose my place. I know what chapter, what line. So I'm always reciting sutras all the time. How about you? At this time, we're like, we're sitting straight up, you know, and, and, and then he turns around and stomps out. <laughs> Just drops that, that bomb on us, you know, and it was perfect teaching because I remember I was sitting next to the former Hangzhou, Gary Leinberger, and, and we're both like, for the rest of the sit, we were just like that. And how do you react to hearing something like that? One thing you can do is say, don't believe it. Can't be true. Because who, I have trouble keeping one channel going. Here's someone who just said three channels simultaneously. So you can dismiss it. Disregard it. This guy, that's not what he meant. He didn't mean that. You know. Or you can go, wow. The mind can do that? What is the mind capable of? Is the question. And what clearly, if you are able to recite the Buddha's name and mantras and a sutra, 
at the same time and be clear. It's not chaotic, it's not jumbled, it's not haphazard. That must mean that you're, you're able to use functions in the mind that don't require the same kind of conscious discrimination that I'm using right now. Maybe, right? So it's conjecture, but imagine. So that's another way to take that kind of teaching is, really, Shifu? Wow. I got a long way to go. And that, that was the, you know, that was the subtext of Shifu's comment was, <laughs> you guys are just so puny. You know, why can't you do those things? Why can't you recite the Buddha's name clearly even for an hour without losing track? You're just way too immature in your cultivation. So something like that. Huh? So here we are talking about gong yong hung. These are practices that require effort. And the bodhisattva up to the seventh ground has been cultivating with a conscious effort. It's not automatic pilot. He knows, she knows that she's reciting the Buddha's name and able to focus. Okay, what happens next? What happens next is this. Okay. So this is, I'll just give you the romanization because it's fun to hear these and know them. And pretty soon we can recognize them. Chi, hui, zi, zai, hung, four, uh, five fourth tones, five fourth tones in a row. Chi, hui, zi, zi, zai. There we go. All right. And these have another name. This has another name. All right. Basu, Hi. I have a question about the Gong Yong Hen. Is this is a turn? Gong Yong Hen. Is it a term, you say, Alice? Right. Because okay, Gong Yong. Go ahead. It's like a let me show you. And then hold on to the mic if you want to ask more. Make sure I, I answer what you're asking. Okay, he says, he says, the Bodhisattva on the 10th ground can, uh, in the 10, let's see, in the 10 grounds, the Bodhisattva makes these bodhi share dharmas uh, perfect. He brings them to perfection. However, the seventh ground is the best place to do that. Why is that? Because here on the seventh ground, gong yung hung man, that thing that you just asked about, the practices involving conscious effort are made perfect and then the person masters what I want to show you next which is okay which we translated as uh, effortless practices of wisdom self-mastery big name right 
So yes, my answer to your question, if I understand it, is Gong Yong Hang is a collect. It's a category of practices, and it's also an approach. Yeah, go ahead. So it's three things. No, Gong Yong Hang is Yi Xie Hang Man. Do Yong. If I said it in Chinese. Gong Yong Hang is the Hang Okay. Hang, this name, refers to category of practices that the Bodhi. Isapa has been practicing, and more specifically, it's the way he goes about it. It's like all of his cultivation that requires his mind to move and say, okay, I am now meditating. As long as I am now meditating, that's Gong Yong Hang. I am now reciting the Buddha's name. So that is Gong Yong Hang. Wu Gong Yong Hang, what we're going to find out about next, and the reason this is coming up in this text is there are practices and there's an approach to practice where it's not I am now meditating, it's just like shifting gears in a car. The self is not there, the meditation is not different from not meditating, but it's meditating. It's like that. That's what Gong Yong Hong. There's no separation of subject and object after the seventh ground. It kind of goes to automatic pilot. Does that make sense, Alice? Is that uh, Yeah, no, I got it. Okay, okay. We're only halfway through this explanation, right? He's he calls them what? He says Ru is the the verb to master, to get, what? Chihui, wisdom, zai, effortless mastery, hung practices. This is if we said it in really simple English, it's almost like you do it without trying. Okay. Um, okay, another another question. How many people can ride a bicycle? Raise your hands, please. Or have ridden a bicycle at some point. Okay. Yeah, just about everybody. All right. I remember clearly, I, I learned how to ride a bicycle late. Uh, some kids learned when they were, you know, really young, five, six, seven. I didn't get on a bike till I was like eight or nine, and I remember the first couple times I tried it, I, I did fall over, skin my knee and all, but uh, I was, because my other buddies could get on their bikes and go zoom off to everywhere, I couldn't stand not being able to do that, so I got back on the bike and tried again, and sure enough, like by the third try, wobbling on the bike, you know, I was able to stay up, and I was so proud by the next week, my dad came out, and I was zooming down the street on my bike. Hi, Dad! You know, and I didn't even have to think because I was focused on my buddies up ahead who were a block away, and I had to get up there. So the doing of the pedaling of the bike became unconscious, automatic, you could say. That's the difference between uh, practices involving work or effort and effortless practices of self-mastery. And, okay, now what does that mean? It means that after the seventh ground, the bodhisattva kicks into a different gear. And what he or she can do is astounding. And again, it's just you. It's the mind you're sitting with right this minute on the floor of the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, uh, in front of your computer, watching on YouTube, wherever you might be, in New York City, in, you know, Benogan, Queensland, that very same mind, this very same mind that I'm using right now, is the mind that, when refined, using the Bodhi shared armas, can function like this. It's another s gear. It's another gear. So we've, I've done this before. This is a really good available example. That's a nice bass note. That's a nice bass note. If you do this, 
suddenly you're way up high. An octave. I'm bisecting the string at a certain at the right point, and so from here, normal pitch just by touching the string. So the Bodhisattva now is able to use his mind in that same way, her mind, that from, it goes to There we go, there's the octave. So, wow, you know, that's refined because there's less stuff in the way now. You could say it always. Hello. Sorry, can I add one more thing? Okay, okay. So you say Bodhisattva changed the gear. So this is seventh ground. Actually, it's called the Yuan Xin Di. Mm -hmm. So if you like a move it toward to. If I can't get it somewhere. Traveling far is how we're translating. Yeah. So the question is, is this where he really makes makes a lot of travel? Goes far? <laughs> is that the question or or Yeah, it is. Correct. Yeah. So it is Yuan Xing Di and here, you know, the Bodhisattva it's 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 not that it's suddenly anything. The sudden thing, the sudden big difference, as we've said a lot, happened on the sixth ground. Remember, the sixth ground is about the 12 links, right? And it corresponded to what? To wisdom. If we look at the paramitas as a good measure for what's going on in this, in this, in this sutra, uh, we've got paramitas are what? There's giving generosity. There's precepts or ethical purity. There's patience. There's vigor, sometimes called strength. There's samadhi, meditation. Those are the front five. Then there's number six, and at the sixth stage of this process, something huge happens. We, we always described it over and over again as like an airplane running down the runway. From the first practice, first perfection, if we say paramita, to number five, the, body, the, the plane is going faster and faster and faster. When it gets to six, it does this. It takes off. That's a dramatic difference. And it's the prajna, paramita difference that is repeated. This pattern is repeated over and over again. So in the ten grounds, the same pattern repeated, grounds one through five, were still recognizable. You're still using the same kind of conscious mind that, that we're using now. When you get to six, what happens? Form is not different from emptiness. Emptiness is not different from form. The Bodhisattva takes all living beings across. No living beings are taken across. You get these contradictions. You get self-canceling statements about the Bodhisattva. Why is that true? It's because something opens up in the mind, in my mind, in your mind, at that sixth level of practice. Um, what's called the two levels of truth begin to function. There's the mundane truth, the ordinary truth, uh, which is called provisional truth, where everything is two, right and wrong, true and false, up and down, male, female, yes, no, yin and yang. That's always been true. As far as 99.9% .9 of the population knows, that's all the truth there is. When you get to stage six, ultimate truth opens up. What has happened inside, if we pin it down? Emptiness has happened. The Bodhisattva has meditated to the point where he or she sees through the illusion of stability of form. That this is stable and is always stable and is, that's what it is. The Bodhisattva's own experience shows him her, that that's not entirely true. This is also temporary based on conditions. What's the teaching at that point is the 12 links. How this exists only because this pulled it into being. And this exists only because that, if you can stop the pulling, 
the whole thing goes empty and flat. So that's the experience on that sixth stage. Well, on the sixth ground, the Bodhisattva went through that. So suddenly, uh, he and she have to recalibrate. They have to reorient everything they used to know about reality because it's all upside down now. Things that used to be true are just a convention. Names don't work anymore. This, you know, so here's a, here's a cup, all right? Here's a, a mug, all right? And that's a purple mug. Well, the name has nothing to do with this object. The object itself only hangs together because it's clay that was fired. And it's just all like that. So the Bodhisattva trains, and depending on his vows or her vows, they make it through this crisis. It's a psychological crisis. You think you're going nuts when things don't hold together the way they used to. Anymore. And so what's the difference? The Bodhisattva has made vows to end suffering for himself and for others. He's made a vow to become a Buddha. And the way he's going to become a Buddha is through removing the covers and the knots, untie the knots out of his nature and all living beings' nature. So, rescue living beings, accomplish the Buddha's way. It's the Bodhi result. With that as the, the, uh, the heart set, that's the course, the Bodhisattva makes it through. Goes through that crisis, figures stuff out the new way. And what we're doing right now in number seven is expedient wisdom. The Bodhisattva is learning ways to teach. He sees clearly that Truth isn't entirely true. False isn't entirely false. He can use all kinds of methods now to teach living beings how to wake up. Methods that before that were not available. He can appear in different forms to speak Dharma. That's all available to him now. So the far traveling from here onto the tenth is just improving that, is refining that ability. He becomes a better and better and better teacher. Okay, we're going to find out what that is. So here is the crossroads. This we're at the intersection, the the at the crossroads, where uh, he can choose not to do it. And some do, some stop. It's just too much. Um, we'll see how it works. This is really an exciting part of the ten grounds, which is an exciting part of the sutra, because the bodhisattva's got some big decisions ahead and it's, there's no guarantee. So what does it say? It says, on the seventh ground, practices involving application of effort, hard, you know, focusing me and my practice, are refined to perfection. The me has gone away. So you master the effortless practice of wisdom's self-mastery. Clumsy translation. Okay, so now, um, we heard about the seven Bodhi shares, Chiputifadva. And I mentioned that they have different names. Last week we looked at a list of them. Here we are. This is last week's lecture. The Bodhisattva brings the paramitas to perfection, also the four dharmas of attraction, the four supports, 37 categories, three doors, Bodhi share dharmas. And I showed everybody this guy. Where are we? Right. This was Professor Lancaster's uh, 37 limbs, 37 wings of awakening. Let's see here. 37 There we go. From the Dodger Dulun, from the, the commentary to the Great Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. And what we're looking at here is a conversation from the Dajra Dulun, this, this amazing Indian-Chinese commentary that's supposed to be Nagarjuna, Bodhisattva, but some people think it's actually Kumarajiva, the translator, who had as much to do with it as Nagarjuna. So what are those 37 limbs of enlightenment? It's a list of 37 practices that are now being practiced. They are four applications of mindfulness, four right efforts, 
the four bases of psychic power, the five faculties, the five powers, seven limbs of enlightenment, and the noble eightfold path. 37 altogether, lots of numbers, right? To, to, to give us a flavor of it, I'm going to talk about these. These four. When the disciple comes to the place of the teacher and hears the teaching of the Tao, he first uses mindfulness to hold on to the teaching. That is what is meant by application of mindfulness. Okay? So, just to give you a sense of it, to, we're going to nail this down. We get these lists, and they're, you know, gee whiz. There's so many, and there's a lot to learn. What's the point? What use is this? Well, I want to make the case that these are not only useful, they're precious. Can't do without them if you want to cultivate. Four applications of mindfulness, Sunni and true. We had the Sanskrit here. Let's get the Okay, by golly, kaya nupasana, kaya, Sanskrit, kaya nupashtana, mindfulness of body, mindfulness of feelings, vedana nupashtana, citta nupashtana, and dharma nupashtana. What are these? These are four contemplations, four ways of looking, and I want to Hope people will go from this making making tremendous sense because these, these these are so beautiful. Move that up. Okay, down here. Okay, so let's take a look at what they are. Guan. Guan. Here we go, Guan Shen. Wu. Qing. If I make a mistake here, correct me directly. Don't don't wait to tell me I've got it wrong. Guan Shen Bu Jing. Guan. Where'd it go? Show. Uh Guan Shen Bu Jing Guan Shou uh, let's see Guan Shou uh Guan Shen Bu Jing Guan Shou Wu Chang Guan Shi Ku Guan Shou Shi Ku Guan Xin Wu Chang Wu Chang Guan Fa Wu Wu Thank you, Alan. Okay, here they are. These are the four. Four contemplations, the four applications of mindfulness. What does that mean? Four places to think, four, four contemplations to look at. Keep these in mind. Remember this stuff. That, that's just remember, remember these. Okay, that's good enough. Remember these. Four, play, four things to remember. How about that? Okay, what is it? We contemplate how the body is not a pure object, or that the body is not. We contemplate how feelings uh, lead to dissatisfaction. We contemplate how thoughts do not last. And we 
contemplate how dharmas, this is tricky, are free of any <laughs> discrete identity. Here we go. Of any separate identity. All right, take a look at this. The um, Notice this is not Chinglish, right? I'm working to get it into actual English that people say. There were ways to translate in the past that were distinctly Chinglish. You know, it's uh, you want to match the word order of the Chinese just because that's what we do. And we went wrong when we did that. We, we made it opaque, and it's not opaque. This is clear... Clear Dharma. The Buddha is a master communicator. There we go. All right. I'll quit fussing with this in a minute. This is what we're talking about when we say We contemplate. These are the first of the 37 limbs of enlightenment. And the, the Bodhisattva gets better and better at cultivating these throughout the 10 grounds. But when he gets to the seventh ground, he gets really good at it. There's a change at the seventh ground. And what are they? This is, mind you, the first. You saw that whole list, right? 37 things, and this is only the first one. After these four, there's four more, and four more, and five more, and five more, and then seven more, and then eight more, right? This is the beginning. So if we are setting out on the to do the work that a bodhisattva does in order to help people he, she cares about get over their suffering, we better be good at this. This is a place to begin. What is it? Okay, it's mindfulness says one translation of body, feelings, thoughts, and notice it says mental qualities. Chinese is fa, dharmas. What is it? Contemplate. What do you do? You notice, you look at your body, and you go, wow. Hmm. Now, pure shouldn't be opposite of impure. It's not, it's not in the sense of dirty. That's not the idea, although it can be used that way, and it's helpful if we're attached to the body as you know, making it very beautiful. And if somebody else's body is very beautiful and we notice and we're paying a lot of attention, then contemplating the dirty nature of the orifices and you know, what your mouth feels like when you wake up in the morning after, you know, night of sleep, that's helpful. But that's, it's not necessarily that. Pure here, I think, means more like essential. It's mixed. Right? The body's a mix. If you don't believe it, my goodness. Um, think back to when you used to eat meat. I know you all stopped eating meat, right? So I remember my mother would bring home chickens and the pull out, and these are back in the days before chickens came neatly packaged in, in white saran, white plastic packs from the, from the butcher shop. This was in earlier days. And inside the chicken, if you pulled out the, the various innards of the chicken, they were all colored, and you could see the blood vessels, and you could see the, the blue, and the red, and the yellow, and the pink and the purple and the, you know, go, whoa, take a look at the body. In the Theravada tradition, uh, they have the 36, they contemplate, they have a chant about the 36 impurities of the body, designed to help us get past our attachment to looking pretty, right? Because how much time and money do we spend trying to get our bodies looking different than they do? Well, a lot. If that weren't true, uh, Save Right uh, drugstore wouldn't have shelf after shelf of cosmetics. Right? So, contemplate how the body is not a pure object. When you do that, what happens? 
you keep mindfulness of that and your your energy goes to a different place. You don't prioritize aiming for some perfection of beauty that too often is manipulated by others. You know, the the notion that every woman is supposed to look like an uh, an anorexic fashion model. And if you're not, if you don't look like that, there's something wrong with you. That is so destructive. There's a huge problem with anorexia and bulimia in among young women who they can't eat. As soon as they eat, they go into the bathroom and put their finger down their throat to vomit so that they will look good during swimsuit season, right? And who cares? You know, that's external manipulation of what is natural, which is everybody's got a body. Nobody doesn't have a body unless they're a ghost or a spirit. So if we can constantly guan sheng bu jing, keep this in mind, we can notice that the body indeed is that way. You know, if we don't believe it, when was the last time you were sick? Wow. As soon as you get a cold, better grab the Kleenexes because you're going to leave this trail of mucus and snot for the next, you know, three days, four days, five days, six days a week. And if the body is pure and satisfying, how is that the case? Okay. So that's number one. That's very, it changes things if you contemplate that way. Now, it's Hush. wrong. Yes. Hi. Is this Yuhan? Hi. Yes. Hush. Since uh, you already gave us a little bit, a little bit online about Bu Jing Guan, um, right. contemplate the uh, impurity of the body. So for right. practitioner, if they want to go deeper about this Dharma door, uh, which book or which sutra uh, we can study, and also okay. what's the differences between the uh, the Bu Jing Guan and the Bai Gu Guan? Okay. Also, for people who want to pr uh, practice this two dharma door, is there any limitation for for ages? Because when I go back, when I went back to Taiwan many years ago, I went to a bookstore, and the bookstore about the the Bu Jing Guan and Bai Gu Guan, they were wrap they were wrap the plastic, um, the, and on the book cover they say. Um, People who under the 80 years old may not be able to read this book, or will be. You have to be very careful of reading this book. So, yeah. of course, every kid that I ever ran with immediately wanted that book. You know, because that's as kids, you're you're curious about that. So, sure, that's that's a good question. Um, let me run through the four, and then we'll come back and uh, with the time we have, talk about the 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 questions you ask you on. So this is again four basic orientations to get us into a new perspective on our lives in the world. First is the body and the body is how we move around the world. It's I know people who spend all of their money on clothes. They really do. That how they look is a very important to them. They are always a la mode, you know, dressing the latest fashion. Okay, okay, so that's one way to go. But the reality is, underneath the fancy clothes, Ming Pai clothes, name brands, it's the same old aging connection of earth, air, fire, and water that's temporary and kind of balanced, but not really solid. Okay, number two, it says, let's go deeper than the, just the body, the body's kind of coarse, earth, air, fire, and water. When you go into the next level, there are feelings. Feelings are two things, sensation and also emotion. Feelings is kind of a generic word that here it's show, right? So show means to receive things that your body receives. So it says shi ku, or sometimes it's guan shou jie ku sometimes. Right, all, jieku. So, um, does it mean suffering? Are all feelings suffering? Clearly not. Some feelings are very pleasant, right? 
So that's why I didn't translate it as all feelings are suffering. No, it's feelings lead to dissatisfaction. When you pursue feelings, what happens? They go away. They change. If you don't believe it, find happiness that stays. It's hard, right? Happiness. Uh, what do they say? Trouble comes too early. Happiness leaves too early. Trouble. What Joni Mitchell song? Trouble comes too easy. Trouble leaves to see. Happiness leaves too early. Trouble leaves too slow. That's it. Good times leave too early. Trouble leaves too slow. So it's that way. And if you look at the, re the experience that we've had, if you, we all are honest about experiences we've had, feelings don't hit the spot. They don't last. So what do you do? Does this say become a piece of wood, become an object that has no feeling? No, clearly not. It's a guan. It is a place of mindfulness. You are mindful of feelings and you don't if you look at it clearly, you don't waste a lot of time trying to manipulate feelings the way you want them because it's never going to work. Just this is a huge liberation for a lot of people. Um, Ajahn Sumedho has been very, very successful over his years of teaching in Europe with just this point. These, these four, these, this is a common dharma shared between Theravada and Mahayana. He's, uh, uh, you can hear Ajahn Sumedho's voice as he, he speaks about, you know, this, is the, this crosses over to the first noble truth, right? The suffering. Ajahn Sumedho would say, in his deep rumbling maritone, he would say, well, we are all promised by the products we buy. Happiness, satisfaction. Delight, the bliss of ownership, the joy of consumption. And yet, for all of us, how quickly it turns to frustration, dissatisfaction, anxiety, anger, rage. You know, and the longer Ajahn Sumedho talks, like, the more afflicted you get, and you realize that's true. That's true. I hate this. I just, I just, ah, stop talking already. I can't stand. And he, then he would use the Dharma to release those feelings. But I remember that was one of his hallmarks was to speak directly to. At the time, it was 20th century diseases of the mind and heart shared universally in England, in France, in Switzerland, in Germany, in Italy everywhere, Spain, you know, and as a result, hundreds of people left home with Ajahn Sumedho, particularly because they saw this. Feelings do lead to dissatisfaction. Why am I spending my life running from pain, pursuing pleasure? It doesn't last. What's the point? Running for name, running for benefit, why? Because I'll be happier with them? No, I make so many enemies in the pursuit of those that I wind up miserable from the other side. You know, so yeah, contemplate, like see how it is. And from here, Ajahn Sumedho would say, right? What is the Dharma? The Dharma is things as they are. He would say, things as they are. The Dharma is about things as they are, not the way. Advertising promises them, and not the way uh, Hollywood uh, leads us to expect it's going to be. Right? It it reads better than it lives. You know that idiom? When we hear it, it sounds a lot better than what it actually turns out to be. Okay, so we got what? Body, coarse. Feelings, a little less coarse. What? Thoughts. Wow, thoughts are subtle. They're quick. How do we contemplate them? They don't last. Thoughts go doop, doop, doop. But what do we do in the midst of that? 
instead of contemplating how thoughts don't last, we anticipate things that haven't arrived and we brood over things that have already gone past. And the current moment, the present thought, we don't recognize it. So how strange we are. And because of that habit, we get afflicted. So if we can contemplate, this is called the four applications of mindfulness. If we can apply these contemplations, be mindful of mental states. Well, yeah, mental states, thoughts, chin, chitta, right? Notice, thoughts rise and fall. Everything that rises in the mind ceases in the mind. You yourself can observe that. The Buddha wants to empower us to notice, to see that is true. This is things as they really are. What are they? Wu Chang. They're not permanent. They don't last. They move on. Transient. Right? Moving on. And then, last one, the hardest one to really grasp, but when we do, boy oh boy, liberation from all kinds of confusion is in this last one. We contemplate how, it says here, mental qualities, okay, fa, dharmas, small d dharmas, phenomena, states of mind, have no separate identity, no self in there, free of a separate identity, free of any separate identity, free of a self. Okay? Free of self is hard because we don't know what the self is. So, you know, if we don't know what the self is, it's hard to know what it's, when it's missing. But it's dharmas. If you look out, the things in my life that I project a self onto, that's my car. That's my career. That's my family. That's my pride, right? You've hurt my pride. You've insulted me. Drop dead. Bang, bang. You know, you looked at me the wrong way. Bang, bang. That's totally to be tied up in the lack of truth, tied up in the inability to contemplate how there is no self in anything. Dharmas, everything that is created, conditioned dharmas, you cannot identify it with anything. That's totally a projection of the mind. When you pull the projection of the mind back, dharmas just go bloop. You empty out the self, you empty out dharmas to get liberated here. So, all right, there we go. From coarse, which is the body, to a little more refined, to really refined, to total penetration of the environment around you. So, body, feelings, including sensations, thoughts, and dharmas. What do you do? You look at them. You contemplate them. Contemplate how they are not pure, they dissatisfy, they don't last, and you can't identify them with anything. To be able to do that, what's a contemplation? Just see it that way. Let it go. It's not real. It's a contemplation. It's a technique of looking. It's a lens that you hold up to, you know, you're holding up this lens to be able to see through and say, oh, look, that's, that's really the way it is. I, I see it that way, you know. Okay, so then you take the lens down, and it's back to normal, but you have gained in insight. You've learned. You've seen it that way, and it's never the same again. This is how Bodhisattva begins to cultivate those 37 limbs of enlightenment. Okay, so Iwan asked a question, and I'm going to... Um, Visudhi... Path of Purification. Okay, check this out, Iwan. Go out to Access to Insight. Not this minute. You have to wait. Wait till you get home. Access to Insight is a blessing. It's a um, website with Pali texts in English translation. Here is a book they offer for free, for free download. 
this is the Vasudhi Magga, translated as the path of purification. The classic manual of Buddhist doctrine and meditation, well translated by Bhikkhu Nyanamali. And this has been around for a very, 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 very long time, Vasudhi Magga, reprinted. Buddha Gosa was the Selenese patriarch who taught this. What is the Vasudhi Magga? It's a commentary. Just like our, you know, Hua Yin Su Chao, um, all the different commentaries, the Dajra Dulun itself. And what is it? It's a meditation manual. Now this used to be, this is the Buddhist, uh, the uh, reprinted by the Buddhist Publication Society. This was, uh, I believe, uh, where Bhikkhu Bodhi was the chief uh, for a long time. They have done wonderful work um, in making available in English all these Buddhist texts from the Pali tradition. And Visuddhimagga was available for purchase for a long time, but it's there's no copyright, it's long expired, and this translation has become a standard, so it's available for download. This is a PDF. Notice you can click it here, and I'm, I'm encouraging people to do that because it's really good for meditation. Look at the contents. Part one, virtue, shila. Part two, concentration, samadhi. Part three, understanding or wisdom, prajna. And it's excellent for the common elements shared by Mahayana Theravada alike. And it's a clear, progressive, step-by-step -step explanations of many, many meditation techniques. Um, I've used this book extensively to understand um, a lot and a lot of the uh, the basics, the basic um, techniques that are mentioned in the uh, Avatamsaka, the Lotus, the uh, Amitabha Sutra that Shrifu gave us. Uh, here is a, a way to refresh and to complete because the Visuddhimagga is for things like Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, Twelve Links, etc. It's very clear and definitive. Here is the question you ask, Iwan. Foulness as a meditation subject. This is how you do the contemplation of impurity. Bu Jing Wan. Notice. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then ten is the end. This is these are the stages a dead body goes through on its way to recycling, right? When something dies, let's say you see a raccoon or a possum on the, by the side of the road, you know, too bad, sad, or a deer, a deer's carcass, right? It bloats, it changes color, it festers, it breaks up, animals come to chew it, it gets scattered, these are two together. The um, fluids come out, the worms appear, the internal parasites, and what's left is a skeleton. Okay, those are the nine contemplations of a decaying corpse. Of, that's one of the uh, topics in the Vasudhi Magga, the path of purification. So I'm just sharing this because access to insight, bless their hearts, makes it available on their website, done very nicely, and they're offering it for free. Okay, now what I wanted to say was, we um, I used as an example um, the you know the body and how we pay a lot of attention to its beauty and its youth and and skin and the hair and 
on and on and on, and then the things we put on the body. And sometimes uh, contemplations like uh, guan shen uh, bu jing, right? Contemplate how the body is not pure. Um, that's a useful contemplation because it balances the marketplace that tells us our bodies are supposed to look a different way when we understand that they tell us that for profit. People like to make a living, so they make products and sell them to us. They have to tell us why we need it. So they do it through our insecurity, our, our greed. And you, too, can look like this. And then they show us this picture of some person uh, Clearly, the photograph has been altered to make it perfect. You know, uh, anybody who's ever used Photoshop knows how far you can push images. And so we look at that image and go, well, I don't want to look like that. So I'll pull out my money, my card, and, and buy the product. Okay. So we, we spend hours and hours of our precious fleeting life trying to look different than we look. Okay, so Iwan said, what about the contemplations of impurity? What's that all about? Is the Bu Jing Guan the same as the, what was, what did you say? The, there's two kinds of, of contemplations. One is the Bu Jing Guan and Jiu Kong Chang Liu. And the other one is the Bai Gu Guan, contemplate the, uh, the okay. white bone or Skeleton. white skeleton? Skeleton, yeah, so, okay. The Bai Gu Guan is the last step of the Bu Jing Guan. They're the same. The complete one is the Bu Jing Guan. Here's the point I want to make. Um, when I was a beginning cultivator, I was like really excited because, oh boy, I, I wanted to get enlightened right away. And so all bodies are filthy and impure, and, and I didn't want to look at anything except my own mind and get that out of my way. And... I want to let's let's all go down to the morgue to look at at uh, corpses pulled in out of the ambulance. You know, had these kind of um, unwise uh, enthusiasm of a beginner. Um, what does the Visuddhimagga say? The Visuddhimagga says, "Ah, young monk." It was in a male-centric world that this was created, but it's totally applicable. He said, ah, monks. He said, should you decide that you want to counter excess lust, the fires of lust in your mind, he said, here is a method you can practice should your teacher determine it is suitable for you. Here's what you do. In your comings and goings from the village to the monastery, perhaps on alms rounds, you may run into, have the opportunity to see perhaps an animal by the side of the path, or a bird, or a snake, uh, some creature by the side of the path. Inform your teacher that the opportunity has presented itself. Ask him for his advice. Okay? The teacher, if he deems it is suitable, will say, all right, young monk, here, now, speak the Dharma, understand the context, and then approach the, uh, the decaying corpse after the teacher has ascertained what stage it's in to begin with, and go no closer than 25 paces and observe. Notice carefully what state it's in. And then go back and meditate on what you've seen. All right. The next day, go 15 paces away and observe and look for a certain amount of time and go back and meditate on what you've seen. The third day, you can go 10 paces away and observe from a distance the state of the corpse for a brief time, then go back, talk to your teacher, and meditate on what you've seen. Right? And then, uh, if, if the, and it says, if at any point aversion arises in your mind. If at any point in your mind you feel, stop and go back. Okay, and then it says on the fourth day you can come closer and at this point the, the changes will be obvious 
and make your conclusions and then go back and meditate. Uh, then, you know, your, if you have done this successfully and you have not felt aversion and your teacher says it's okay, then you can continue to walk by and observe and then respectfully, when the time is right, uh, bury the, the animal like that with full respect, right? So when I read this, it was like, oh man, that takes all the fun out of it. You know, it's like, I, don't you want to see the gore? Don't you want to see the excitement? Well, you know, and I realized, man, I have seen entirely too many cops and robbers TV shows and movies. I've seen too many violent killings on the, on the silver screen that I'm numb to what the Vasudhi Maga is telling us, which is death and decay of the body is a shocking thing. And you approach it slowly with respect. Right? It's not that you're going to root out lust, smash all those dirty, defiled thoughts by seeing, you know. It's not that at all. It's like compassion is number one. And we have this body because we came from our parents. And use it to cultivate wisely. We don't smash or cut off anything by observing ugly, the ugly truth of the body. We gradually, bit by bit, recognize what sameness. The point of the whole contemplation is compassion. Tong ti tabe. That at a certain point, gradually, as you look at that decaying corpse, you go, oh yeah, that's me. Me too. Me too. You won't get there. I won't get there if I look at it and go, yeah. You know. Oh, wow, look at the bugs crawling out of its eye sockets. Cool. Wow, there's a worm coming out of its belly. Wow. That's not, you know, if you do that, forget it. You're not, you're not doing the contemplation. So to, you know, it, it's the whole thing is in the mind. If I look at my body and want it to be different than it is, and if I look at others' bodies and I feel attracted to them, then I have not seen the nature of it. But the way you counter that is not to hate it and be repelled and cut it off and destroy it. It's not, because you won't, you won't get to the goal, which is to recognize sameness, that all beings are bodies born of karma and natures inside that are not yet awake, right? When, however you can see that, that's the right path to use. And so the Vasudhi Maka is really, really helpful for me on that because it slowed me down and it showed me how much I missed, how coarse my I had become through watching too many fireballs in too many movies, you know, too many bodies being blown up in the name of realism on the screen. So I thought this is just normal and natural. We should all go stare. You know. So, um, in uh, I was disturbed at uh, at uh, Tathagata Monastery. At some point, somebody in our sangha uh, put up pictures of of from morgues of corpses, uh, bloody and and gory, and it was somehow it was meant to shock you as you washed your hands after using the bathroom or something. And it was really, really harsh and unwise. And I, because I don't live there, I, my tendency was to want to go rip them down and say, get real, you, you totally, no wisdom here, you know. You don't want to look at, if you want to really get serious, take the mirrors down so you can admire yourself. But don't equate the, you know, don't shock me into saying, oh good, you're, you're actually a skeleton covered with meat and blood and pus, that's, yeah, helpful, but not for everybody all the time. You're going to destroy other people's mindfulness by doing that. So anyway, so that's the Vasudhi Magga is available, and you just saw how to get it, how to download it. Um, now, that all being said, is this a familiar book to people? You all know this one? This is Bhikshuni Hangyin's, not our 
Hung Yin, this is Bhikshuni Hung Yin, Lani Bauer, the former Bhikshuni Hung Yin's songbook for her CD called Songs for Awakening. And uh, I brought this, it's good timing that this came up today. I brought this out at our, our meditation class here at Gold Coast. Uh, and I sang for everybody the song called My Body. And it's exactly the nine contemplations of a decaying corpse in song form. And it's hilarious. And uh, Hung Yin, Bhikshuni Hung Yin, former Bhikshuni Lani Bauer, recorded it with a chorus including Terry Epstein. Watson was in the chorus that sang behind her, her backup chorus. The song that she recorded for the Songs for Awakening CD made it onto the top 40 in the Bay Area. It became a popular song for a certain number of months in the Bay Area. There was one DJ, Phil somebody, who was pushing. He heard the song and he loved it and he pushed it and he, he got people to listen to it and buy it. But it's exactly that. My body, where did it go? My body, I loved it so. So cute, so fine, this body of mine. Vince, do you remember that? Were you around when that song was being played? This 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 see this uh, this music, I think that was back in the Gold Mountain time. Was that something that you heard about? Yes, I remember the whole thing. I don't, I don't remember the song specifically, but I do remember that era. There's, yeah, yeah. I don't. I didn't know about their being on the radio. I didn't know that it was. It was. Song. Okay. It was. I wasn't listening to the radio at the time. Yeah, right. It wasn't. It wasn't, uh, well, actually, Shrifu got behind uh, Lonnie's CD effort and uh, promoted it. And, it, you know, it's an expedient way of, of teaching the Dharma. But um, the song is great. It's, it's got all nine. I remember the way out west in Amitabha's country. country. Way out west in Amitabha's land. Yeah. yeah. Did Just she also the, sing, sorry, did she also sing... Um, uh, there's nothing left to do but cult to cultivate. Is that the one? Okay. Yeah. You've got nothing else to do. Might as well cultivate. Um, I I have this CD and I play it regularly. It's it's an outstanding uh, musical. It I mean it's really excellent. She covers many genres. She has country and western. She's got some rock and roll. She's got folk music, some hymns. You know, it's just excellent. And this is a kind of a a ragtime spoof on the nine contemplations of the decaying corpse. I guess now that I've talked about it, I have to sing it for you, don't I? Where did it go, my body? I loved it so, my body. So cute, so fine, this body of mine. My body was the cutest thing, gave it the best of everything. Plenty of fresh air and exercise, vitamins and minerals and apple pies, plenty of sleep, Plenty of friends, rode it around in a Mercedes Benz. But then it came time to die. It left and never said goodbye. And now the, the beat goes to bum, 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 and it picks up. And when it died, it got so big and green. This bloating. So many worms you've never seen. Worm infested. All my old friends quit the scene. Losing of friends. Smelled just like an old latrine. Then the birds joined in the feast. Dismemberment. They didn't mind the stink the least. Now all that's left is bones so bleached. Who would have guessed it could happen to me? Right? So now it's ashes to ashes and dust to dust. All because of hate and lust. Sure seems we make a lot of fuss over something that's just blood and pus. And they go, ooh, right? Where did it go, my body? So take a tip from a ghost like me. Your body's going to leave you. Just wait and see. Better cultivate while you can, my friend, because when it's all over, it's really the end. So that's, that's uh, my body. And that was a popular song, believe it or not. People were buying it and laughing. And at the same time, absorbing the nine contemplations of the decaying court. So, thank you for the question there, Ihuan. Uh, that's a uh, 
one aspect of Buddhist cultivation. Now, um, there's a question. Yes, question. I just, I just want to Hi. mention yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, that this whole album is available in the website Dharma Bliss. Mm. Org, and this everyone can download and MP3. <laughs> Dharma Bliss. Dharma Bliss. Org. I guess this is the one of our uh, branch. Uh, in, this is from Australia. I guess this website. Dharma Bliss. Org. Yeah. Songs. Songs. And will be here. We go. Songs Here's for songs for awakening. To see the lyrics, apparently you can't download it, but you can listen. To see, to listen, see lyrics, and sing along, click here. Okay, here we go. This is the way out west right here. Let's see if I've got the requisite drivers to play it. Maybe not. I don't think I have the right quick time. But here they all are. Here are all the songs. And... Uh, my body is right here, by golly. So, there we go. If you all turn, when you get home, get a chance, look at dharmabliss.org for Songs for Awakening. Okay, dandy. Um, anyway, um, question was, uh, where will I be speaking Dharma in Hong Kong? Uh, don't know yet to be determined because I will be leaving here. By the way, that's one of our announcements here before we transfer the merit is this coming weekend I will be in transit. I'm leaving Saturday night. I'll be arriving Sunday morning when uh, is our lecture time in Hong Kong and I'll be staying for up to 10 days it looks like. Um, if our business in Hong Kong concludes more quickly we may uh, travel to um, we've been invited to China for um, for a work with a school. Um, we're providing education and books for schools, so it'll be a kind of a social service visit um, in Hong Kong. So if um, if there's an opportunity for Dharma speaking in Hong Kong, I'll put it out on my blog on uh, Dharma Forest and. We'll, we'll make it available through the various networks. But right now, there's no particular date being planned. So next week, we're going to invite uh, Jin Foshi and the monks. Is that correct? Uh, Jin Foshi and, and Jin Hosher are both. Is that right, Jin Hosher? Are you going to be carrying on the, uh, the Dharma speaking next week? Um, I think it's just Jin Foshi because Jin Chuan Shi and myself will be in Georgia. Oh. Mm -hmm. This is a, there's a, the uh, Buddhist community in Georgia and Atlanta are going to have a, uh, their summer camp. And Master Mingguang from Taiwan, Mingguang Pashu, is coming. So Jin Chuan and Jin Husher went last year and it was a big hit. So they're going back this year. That's great. Lots of uh, good energy in the summer camp there. Do we have any other announcements? Jin, Jin Hosher, do you want to? Um, um, so everyone knows that the summer classes have winded down. To, um, so Doug has stopped his Monday evening as well as Mardi on Friday evening. Today was the last day of the first ever Sudana retreat. Mm -hmm. and, um, we actually have, uh, apart from myself, eight other people in the room here who, who were at the retreat. Mm -hmm. um, the feedback that we had was extremely positive. Yeah. And I think everyone is looking forward to, to more to more retreats at Sudana Center. How how did it go? Anybody want to share a a snapshot? A postcard? I think so I'll just name who was who was there. Alan, Jin Shansho, uh, Michael, Pedro and then e Juan, uh, Alice, Dina, and Connie. So maybe okay. I'll, just pass the phone, uh, I'll pass the mic to, to Alan. Yeah, just if anybody has anything to share, not that you have to, but if you'd like to. What was it like? Our first retreat at the Sudana Center. Yeah, it was wonderful. I think that place 
wow, it's really perfect for, for the retreat. So it has a very beautiful courtyard in the center, and then the beautiful Buddha hall on one side, dining hall on the other mm -hmm. side, and dorm dormitory on the top. So the energy is very well contained. So your mind naturally kind of get drawn in, okay, the practice or the sutra reading discussions. So it's a very, very kind of ideal place for, for retreat for meditation. Just wonderful. Nice. On the screen, I've got a picture of the new uh, Buddha Hall, Chan Hall at Sudhana Center. This is set up for the graduation. It won't always look like this, but the RBU's graduation just happened and the commencement. And so this is, but the, uh, you'll recognize some of these uh, images on the wall. Great. Anybody else? Um, I uh, really enjoyed the dynamic between Doug and Hung Chur, and they would mm -hmm. kind of like pass it on on each other when they didn't know the answer, and it was just really entertaining to watch. And the whole week, it for me, it just felt like being in rehab for some reason. <laughs> we, were, we were in we were in noble silence, and like the courtyard had a very rehab facility vibe to it, uh -huh. and uh, it was just it was just uh, a great week, and it was yeah, that's my share. Nice. What was it like withdrawing from uh, email and and Instagram and Snapchat for a week? Maybe I can say that these two images the Bodhisattvas Guan Yin look like they were made just for this place. <laughs> there and the energy in the Buddha Hall is really. I can say unique or really resonate with the heart and mind, and mm -hmm. it's really something special. If you know this, I don't know how many was the, were people there, like eighty or fifty. Uh -huh. When fifty people change together in the morning and afternoon, it was so nice. The acoustic mm -hmm. are really special, and mm -hmm. like Dharma Master mentioned about this four qualities or bodhisattvas, you can really easily find there. <laughs> it was a lot of, of giving. Everyone, this retreat was made by uh, people's effort. Everyone work and do something, and including the cooking, cleaning, and all these things. You know, it was a lot of good words from the teachers and the group's discussions. And sometimes the best talk is no talk. We had the noble silence. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. oh, and of course, a cooperation. And people really well works together. And really nice, nice, uh, okay. excellent uh, memory now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, wonderful. OK, I think we've got time for one more. Somebody else want to share? Nobody, everybody's shy. <laughs> that Tina? Can I see? Yes, I'm Tina. Hi, Tina. Um, well, my reflection was, um, it was really nice for me because every time when I I have to prep myself to go on a retreat, especially uh -huh. like to go to any retreat, um, CCTV, Buddha Ru Farm, because yeah. I know that there will be a lot of work. Um, mm -hmm. And <laughs> I will go there and then counting the day to come back and rest. <laughs> mm. And um, But this time I actually have a lot of time to rest. Um, and I did do some community work, everybody chip in. Um, and I get to feel this, I can breathe. My body actually is breathing. Mm. And I have time to study meditation and attend the session. And um, I feel, wow, if this is the, the life, um, mm. I can do it um, to, I don't know, cultivate or you know, mm. this thought came up. If not, I will run away. So, mm. yeah. Nice. Yeah, I hear you. Great. Right. Well, I'm glad that worked well. Um, that's a realization of a dream, you know, to have a, um, a 
place where uh, we can cultivate the Buddha Dharma from a Western perspective. Uh, that's a fully digested Dharma. Uh, while it's, it depends on the Chinese roots, it's the form that we're celebrating is really a Western form. And that's, that's lovely. That's great. That's a maturity, you know. So, yeah, great. Um, I've got, I won't take our time, our time is up, but um, I've got a whole bunch of new photos uh, where this is the autumn. Actually, the first couple days of winter have occurred here, and the critters are very much um, dependent on uh, food to stay alive. And so, oh, not that one. We've, uh, we've been uh, feeding lots of these uh, furry and feathered folks here and uh, getting to know them. And this is uh, Percy the baby possum. Week by week, we've watched him grow up. And he's, he's now, uh, he's still, you know, one quarter the size of the adults. But here, let's get a good one. There we go. There's Percy. He's a charming young man and uh, young male possum. And we've made him kind of chubby. We've fed him a little too much. Uh, and here's his dad. This is uh, Peter the possum, who's a successful male. This is the alpha male of the neighborhood. And uh, he's he and his son come every other night. You can see Percy's just a little bit overweight. That's a chubby possum. <laughs> he's, yeah, so we're putting him on a diet, but um, he's, we just hope we haven't made him too slow, because to, being a, surviving as a possum requires you to run away from uh, from all the other uh, critters that come. And here's a situation that we have developed recently, which is uh, three girl turkeys show up at the same time, supervised by a pair of lorikeets. So now we have three turkey hens, all adjusting the pecking order. It's real. Who gets to eat first, who's second, and who goes last is determined by the turkeys. And uh, we have a peanut gallery here watching them go through all this stuff. So anyway, I'll save my slideshow for when I'm back. We've got lots of lovely uh, stories from the front lines of the, uh, the, the Queensland bush. So, Okay, I need to Wrap it up question. so we. Yes. Sorry, I have, I, have a final. You, huh? yes, okay. I have a for final it. question. Yeah. This nice. afternoon, Alan and I, and also Fashi uh and other uh, CTTB participants went to the Avagari Monastery oh, yes. uh -huh. to join their 20 years um, celebration and the right. anniversary. So tomorrow they they will be have the audition. Ordination okay. ceremony. My question is, what's the differences between the Tarbaga tradition of ordination ceremony and our tradition? Is there any differences there? There is. There are differences. Um, I I would like to save this topic for a time when I can give a full explanation. But in brief, the the differences are small enough or few enough that when we ordain at CTDB, Shurfu was able to invite the Theravada monks to sit with us to do the ordination and it was seamless, right? No gaps. So I guess you'd say, you know, it's it, by and large, it's the same. The order of, of, of procedures is the same. The expectations for the monks and nuns are the same, uh, although in, there aren't nuns in the Thai tradition, but um, it, they would be. Um, the, what's different are the number of precepts they take. They don't take the bodhisattva precepts. Uh, the bhikshu and bhikshuni precepts are different in number. Um, there isn't a bhikshuni precept, say that again. But the, 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 
you can see how both the Pali and the what's called the Dharmagupta, the Silfan Lu, the four division Vinaya, has the same roots back in the Buddha's time. Our ordination goes right back to the Buddha. And I mean, it hasn't changed. And so the with that in mind, when Theravada Mahayana come together, it's it's really beautiful to see how they mix. Now, Ajahn Pasano is the Upadhyaya, he's the precept source, and he has memorized the entire service. It's hour and a half long, and he is up there with his palms together chanting away in Pali from his heart, you know, no book. And the, uh, the, the monks who are going through, who are being ordained, have also memorized their part, but it's just a little part. He's memorized the whole thing. And he explains slowly in a calm voice um, what's, what it means to go forth. And the parents are sitting right there, usually, if they can, the parents and relatives. We don't, allow, in our, the Mahayana version, we don't allow uh, outsiders in to watch. or We don't allow non-bhikshus to, to come into the actual transmission. But in the Pali ways, you know, the best thing I would recommend is that you all jump in the car tomorrow and go up and take part. Um, I know quite a few of us in the hall there have done so, uh, have, have sat in on uh, ordinations at Abhagiri. They do it on the hillside, on an open-air platform. It's just beautiful. And uh, if you've never done it, it'd really be a great thing to witness. Um, you're, you're right there helping the ordinee go through to be, go from novice to bhikshu. Um, and you can feel it. There's an emotional, you know, uh, encouragement and then a, a joy when, when they say, you know, the, uh, the Buddha Sangha has increased by these three and the demon's retinue has decreased by three. And, you know, are you a bhikshu? Yes, I am a bhikkhu. You know, are you a bhikkhu? Yes, I am a bhikkhu. It's, it's, it's a really, it's a real wonderful moment. So, um, that's, they will continue to do this. If you can't do it tomorrow, next time you hear about it, uh, make a point of going up and taking part. It's great. Okay. Yeah, I was happy to be able, I, I would have much, I really wish I could have been there for that. And I'm glad that I was able to at least uh, write my feelings and that they read it. That I was pleased to know that. that okay. Like ele ele yes. Yeah. Actually, the Ajahn Pasano read the email the pastor you wrote uh, to the assembly. So he actually read the whole email in the beginning before we have other guests to talk about the whole event. So we got, we got to hear. I'm glad. So pastor, yeah. yeah, read to him. Yeah, I'm glad he did. Because I, you know, I was on the airplane with Ajahn Sumedho flying down to West Covina to go to where Shrifu was his last few days. And Shrifu says, we have this piece of land. I understand you're looking for a monastery. Sumedho, would you like, would you please accept this offering of, you know, 130 acres of Mendocino County mountainside? And Sumedho goes, yes, I would. He said, <laughs> I would be happy to do that. And uh, so that's how it started, you know, and it was great. It was, it was sure enough, what a gesture to say, you're our neighbors. This is, this is the bigger Buddhahood in Mendocino County. It's the Buddha neighborhood, the Buddhahood in Mendocino County. So, okay, here we go. Dedication of merit. We need to bring that up on the screen. And bring it up on the screen of your heart. Send out the goodness. There we go.
with uncertainness loose. If people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving unity, may our minds awake to great passion, wisdom, and to joy. Because our hearts are one, this world of me turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. Jin Chan Shi, you want to lead everybody in the bowing, or Jin Ho Shi, whoever is ready to do that, you can bow to the Buddhas and see you in a few weeks. Okay, Almi Tofo, everybody. Bye bye.